guys, this is Mike from the Comic Book Troll, welcome to another video. Uh, today I'm going to cover The Sensational She-Hulk by John Byrne Omnibus. This is a book that I've had a few questions about, uh, I had a few people message me um, asking some questions about it, kind of whether or not it's a good run, a good starting point for the character, so I thought it would be a good idea to just kind of go over it today and uh, showcase it a little bit and yeah, just give my thoughts on it and hopefully clear up any confusion about it. Okay, so the Sensational She-Hulk by John Byrne. What have we got here? Let's check out the contents first of all. So we get Marvel Graphic Novel 18, Sensational She-Hulk 1 to 8, and then 31 to 46, and 48 to 50, and material from Marvel Comics Presents 18. Now, this is all written and drawn by John Byrne, and I've got to say I am a John Byrne fan, so I'm a little bit biased maybe towards this run. Um, if you're not a John Byrne fan, well, maybe this won't be for you anyway, but it is quite a unique run, I will say that. Uh, the book had two covers, by the way. So this was the standard edition dust jacket. Uh, the variant, direct market variant, uh, was this, um, which is the cover to the first issue of the series. I do like the fact that Marvel are now tend to do this where the even if you get you know the standard edition or the whichever version you go for the, the actual book itself under the jacket tends to have uh, both images quite often nowadays so it doesn't really matter too much which one you go for um, but this book so why is it unique what's the deal with it um, well it's a very comedic story it's all very deliberately tongue-in-cheek um, kind of like what Deadpool became. Before there was Deadpool, there was John Byrne's She-Hulk, and she is constantly breaking the fourth wall. Uh, the series kind of parodies and spoofs uh, comic book uh, tropes and all kinds of things, really, which we'll take a look at as we go through here. The contents, then, as you will probably have thought, whilst I listed those, there appears to be a break in the series. So you go issues one to eight, then a gap, quite a big gap, uh, between issue 8 and issue 31, so what's that all about? Well, basically after issue 8, John Byrne left the series. I think he was frustrated with the uh, editorial arrangements with the book. He didn't quite like how things were being run, the decisions he was being forced to make, so he left. He left. Um, and then the book was taken over by other writers in that gap between issues 9 and 30. And then John Byrne ended up coming back again with issue 31, Ordinarily, that would probably be an issue, and you would say to yourself, well, this is clearly incomplete, there's a whole chunk of missing issues there, what's the deal? But in this case, probably the only case I can really think of, it really, really doesn't matter that those issues are missing, because John Byrne came back and literally carried on the story as though he had never left. So he continued to write it as though... Uh, he was basically just continuing with issue 9 and he ignored everything that took place between him leaving after issue 8 and coming back with issue 31. So this, despite how it appears, is definitely uh, actually a, com a complete run. Um, there is no, uh, no continuity problems or anything like that by having that chunk of issues missing, which is such a John Byrne thing to do really, when, if you think about it, if you know anything about him as a creator and what he tended to be like. Um, so let's dive in. So we start off with, this is the graphic novel, uh, Marvel, Gra Marvel Graphic Novel 18. So this was John Byrne's first solo story, working with the She-Hulk, but not the first time he'd worked on the character in general, because prior to this, he had actually introduced her to the Fantastic Four for quite a while, um, whilst he was writing and drawing that series. She replaced the Thing, following on from the original Secret Wars event. So he would kind of become attached to the character, I think it's fair to say. And so when he kind of jumped on this series, starting with this graphic novel, um, it wasn't too much of an adjustment, I don't think, because he'd been writing her and drawing her for ages anyway, and clearly taken a liking to the character. So I'm sure, it's, well, I don't, I'm sure, it absolutely, I know really, that he clearly had a lot of fun writing this story. But this, this graphic novel is, unlike the rest of the series, this is kind of the only semi-serious story in the book, in that in this story she's it, she's not breaking the fourth wall particularly she's not it's not all cracking jokes it is a kind of serious story but also 
uh, kind of silly. The gist of this story basically is that um, S.H.I.E.L.D. decides to kind of capture her, to examine her, because there's some concern um, that she could potentially become a big threat to uh, you know, America's national security, just like the Hulk. But they don't want her to become dangerous like the Hulk himself, so uh, they kind of go after her, capture her to analyze her and make sure she's not going to be a threat in the future. Um, but yeah, it ends up being that there are some kind of corrupt agents on board who take things too far, basically, and she ends up having to take down this kind of rogue element of S.H.I.E.L.D. from within. And uh, quite an interesting story. Interesting colours in here. The rest of the book isn't coloured in this way. This is very kind of unique. I don't know if it really comes across in the video, but quite a unique colouring style. Um, where you don't, you just don't tend to see it too often. Um, but it's cool. Now one thing I will say about the series, artistically, it always looks amazing to me. Um, as a John Byrne fan, it looks great, but I will say there are some kind of cheesecake elements, if you know what I mean by that, sort of really pushing the, the limit, I think, on what you could get away with in, in comics at the time. Uh, when I'm talking about kind of near nudity at times, just a little bit, you know, nothing graphic. Nothing that's going to seriously shock, I don't think, but definitely playing to um, <laughs> the kind of the sexiness of the character, I suppose you'd have to say. Uh, so that's the graphic novel. Um, I don't want to spoil it, I say, I, with my read, these reviews, as much as I do go through the book, I will talk about some things, and there will be some stuff I'll probably spoil. Um, but I don't want to talk about every plot in detail, because at the end of the day, I want to basically with this video clarify for you whether or not you're interested in reading this book therefore I don't want to tell you literally everything that happens in it otherwise there'd be no point but this particular story this is the Marvel Comics Presents and it's pretty much just a, an advert a short story that works as an advert for what the series was going to be about because this came out just before the sensational She-Hulk series launched and it gives you a good idea of what the tone of that series is going to be like very much as I said uh, Played for comedy, tongue-in-cheek, breaking the fourth wall, addressing the reader. Um, yeah, and then it uh, just jumps right in. So here you go, issue one. Okay, one thing I didn't mention about this book, I will show it now. Uh, towards, the th uh, during the early months of last year, when the COVID pandemic was just starting out, it caused a lot of disruptions to obviously a lot of things, but the comic book industry was amongst them. And in particular, Marvel's omnibus line was temporarily moved to a different printer, to the one they typically use, or ones they typically use. And what that meant was that this book and a handful of others ended up coming out with uh, a flat spine, completely rigid flat spine, um, which is generally not what they are like. And at the time, in the omnibus collecting community, there was a bit of controversy about this. Uh, some people outraged about the flat spines, hated it. Other people saying, I don't know what your problem is, just get over it, it's a flat spine. I don't care about the fact that it's a flat spine just because of the shape of it. That doesn't bother me. But uh, undeniably, what it does mean, having a flat spine versus a curved spine, is that whereas a curved spine is flexible and allows you allows the book to move more freely as you open it, the flat spine, um, being as rigid as it is, means that there's no movement as you open the book, so unlike in the vast majority of Marvel Omnibus where you could keep this thing open, it's, it tries to close itself. Um, and quite, you know, like for example, if you go back here, you're 50 pages in and it's starting to close itself there. It's not the end of the world, you know, but it's just something worth pointing out that you do kind of have to hold it open a little bit. It's getting to the point here where it's okay. But I just thought I'd mention that. It does also mean on spread pages like this, you get a lot more gutter loss than you would in another book. So She-Hulk sat in the middle of this page, you can't even really see her. You know, she's disappearing into the middle of the book because this spine's just not, it's just not as flexible. 
but for the most part, it's okay. You know, I just, I don't want to hate on it. I'm not saying it's the biggest problem in the world, but it is worth pointing out because it does stand out as a difference from the majority of other Marvel omnibus books. But anyway, into the, back to the content itself. Um, you get a good idea as you read through here of, of the art, uh, of the art style as I flick through it. Pretty much every story in here is just purely fun. Okay, there's nothing in here that's super serious. There's nothing in here um, that's kind of a dark story. There's nothing that's gonna have you feeling down. If anything, this is a great book to read if you want to just read something that's just probably gonna make you laugh a little bit or at least make you smile because of how ridiculous it is. And that's the point. The whole point is that it is supposed to be ridiculous because this at the end of the day is kind of saying, this is what comic book plots are usually like, but they're normally played seriously. But let's just take a step back and acknowledge in this series how ridiculous some of the stuff that happens in comics actually is. Um, also, the first few issues directly mirror the original Stan Lee and Jack Kirby Fantastic Four run, um, by which I mean, for example, in issue two of the Fantastic Four, they met up with the uh, Scrolls for the first time. And in here, She-Hulk meets up with her own kind of alien enemies, but obviously far less, played far less uh, seriously than the scrolls were in the Fantastic Four. And then, oh yeah, the funny thing, another thing I don't think I mentioned so far is that she directly addresses John Byrne, so <laughs> there'll be multiple times throughout this run where she will just turn to the page, as here, and just kind of say, what's all this about, Burn? You know, why, why are you having me fight these guys? These are ridiculous. I'm clearly much better than this. You've got me facing against these idiots. Uh, that style of thing. Um, so yeah, like I say, it's, it's just that case of breaking the fourth wall all the time. Uh, I just think it's cool that everybody now associates the kind of number one character who does that as being Deadpool. But I don't think, generally speaking, it's known that before that was going on, She-Hulk was absolutely playing that game masterfully, uh, thanks to John Byrne. The Spider-Man guest appearance here. Um, actually, if we go back and look at the cover of this issue, if we can find it. Yeah, even here on the cover, she says, my third issue, uh, time for an obligatory guest star, and here he is now. You know what I mean? So it's just like another thing that comics would generally do, especially early on in a new series, you throw in a more popular character as a guest star. Spider-Man was a frequent choice for Marvel, understandably, with him being pretty much the most popular character they've ever had, as a solo character anyway. Um, so yeah, it's just acknowledging that. You know, it's just pointing it out, just saying, yeah, we're just going to throw in Spider-Man here because we need a guest star. So that's why he's showing up. Um, oh yeah, the series also brings back... So in issue four, again, continuing that theme of mirroring, mirroring the Fantastic Four, uh, in issue four of that series, uh, Neymar the Submariner was brought back, having not been seen really since the end of the Golden Age. So in issue four of this series, another Golden Age character is brought back. Um, and that is... Just trying to find it now. Yeah, I've actually forgotten the name of the character, to be totally honest. But anyway, yeah, the point is, it's just mirroring the Fantastic Four. I'll remember the name later and that'll frustrate me, but uh, yeah. The Blonde, that's it, the Blonde Phantom. That's what she's called, the Blonde Phantom. I knew it, I was gonna kick myself if I forgot about that completely. Uh, but the, she's, <laughs> she's, the funny thing is she has aged because she wasn't appearing in comics, so the storyline, uh, the idea, I suppose, the concept that's explored here is that whilst you are in frequently appearing as a character in comic books, 
and they talk about this in these exact terms, you don't age because comic books move at such a slow, the time, you know, time in the Marvel universe, in DC universe, in comic in general, moves so slowly that characters barely age over decades of comics. Um, but she has got older because she hasn't been in comics for a long time. So that's quite a fun discussion that she has with She-Hulk. Um, it's definitely a fun read. It's a pretty quick read. I actually read through this uh, last year when it came out. And I think I read the whole book in about a week or so, just because it's, it's so much fun. Like I say, it's, it's a nice book to read in between, uh, you know, more dense, serious reads. So if you read something like, I don't know, if you're going through Chris Claremont's X-Men, for example, and you feel like just taking a break from something like that, um, and reading something at pretty much total opposite end of the scale, something that is just tongue-in-cheek, pure fun, throughout, doesn't take itself seriously at all, complete opposite, then this is a, definitely a good read. And then here, okay, yeah, so issue 31, so that was just then that was issue uh, at the end of issue 8 and then Byrne left and as I said he came back here with issue 31 and on the cover he's actually trying to pin up uh, an issue number 9 to cover up the 31 um, which like I said he just did not care about the stuff that happened in between he literally wanted to just continue his own run and the, <laughs> the editor on here is actually saying to him look I've told you you can get away with you know pretty much anything but not literally everything um, and yeah so you see, he comes back on, and effectively, this story continues right on from issue 8, so there is not even any acknowledgement of the, of the intervening issues. And this story here, this is, this is quite a good one. So she ends up going underground and meeting up with the Mole Man, and he... <laughs> tries to get her to marry him. Um, which actually is one of my favourite covers, I think, from this series. There it is. I love it. It's just so much fun. Trying to <laughs> trying to get the uh, She-Hulk to marry him, and she's just there looking absolutely disgusted. I like it. It's just funny to me. Um, this thing as well. These kind of living... These are like living mountains or living hills. Um, which is a character, I think it was a real monster character from uh, the pre-Marvel comics years. So before Marvel was Marvel, it was called Atlas Comics during the 50s. And they weren't putting out superhero comics, they were putting out a lot of very generic monster comics and horror comics, uh, you know. Um, and amongst those, many fairly generic and ultimately forgettable characters was that particular one, the Living Hill thing, can't remember exactly what it's called, but anyway, she com it comes back into the story here. John Byrne brings it back. An example here of what I'm talking about with that kind of cheesecake art style. You get quite a bit of that throughout the book. If that's not your thing, then you might get a little bit uh, frustrated with this book at times, that it's repeatedly going there. But one thing you can't deny is just how well John Byrne draws everything. I just think this book looks great. Um, like I say, I'm a big fan of John Byrne's art, so I love his artwork on X-Men, Fantastic Four, Alpha Flight, Superman, uh, Namor, when he did the Submariner series for a bit in the 90s. And this, of course, right up there for me. I just think it's great. It looks, it never looks anything less than brilliant. But obviously that's subjective, like any any opinion on artwork or storytelling is, so I'm here telling you how much fun this book is and how enjoyable it is. Could well be that you're looking through this and thinking, I don't think so. And that's fair enough, because the point of these videos, the whole reason I try and do this and showcase it a little bit, give you a proper look through the book, is so that you can have that opinion. This is John Byrne doing some typical John Byrne stuff. Uh, blank white pages. 
Uh, this is actually a throwback to, there's an issue of Alpha Flight. I actually posted about this on uh, Instagram not too long ago. In the Alpha Flight series, he did an issue where uh, one of the characters in that team, uh, Snowbird, gets into a fight in the middle of a snowstorm, and it results in multiple pages of blank white artwork. It's pretty much exactly like this. And here, she breaks through this page and says, yeah, you, know, uh, you know half the fans hated this gag when you did it in Alpha Flight. At least they gave them balloons and panel orders. So, yeah, there's Byrne parodying himself at this point. Um, and really, yeah, it's just... Uh, it's one of because I don't want to talk about it in too much detail. I find uh, I'm probably just repeating myself over and over, so apologies if that's the case. But, um, yeah, the, the one, the, the absolute best way that I can summarize this book up yet again is just to say that it's so enjoyable to read through. Such a change of pace from pretty much every other comic, because this came out at the back end of the 80s, and from the mid to late 80s in particular, you had stories like uh, Dark Knight Returns, Watchmen, you had the X-Men getting darker and more mature in their series. Um, pretty much every comic, every mainstream popular comic was following in the footsteps of things like Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns uh, and trying to go kind of dark and gritty. Uh, this particular, this sequence of panels where she's jumping, she's jumping through the uh, skipping rope with nothing but motion blur lines to cover her up and it looks for all intents and purposes like she's dancing naked on here uh, but it, it turns out that yeah she's not she actually is wearing underwear but um, uh, that's what I mean that's why that, that, that panel of pages if there's ever anything that pushed the limit of what the comic code would allow allow someone to get away with then John Byrne definitely found that line and stepped right on it some of these panels in here of uh, She-Hulk or Shulky. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the point I was making there about the comics industry is that by this point in time, you get to the late 80s, early 90s, comics were taking themselves so seriously, even if in some cases they were sillier than ever, especially as the 90s really kicked in and all those kind of gimmick events of the 90s took place. Um, they were taking themselves so seriously, so it's just a breath of fresh air to read this book from that time which couldn't be further apart from those books. You know, here's a book that's just absolutely taking nothing seriously. And I've got to think that Byrne had a great time working on this for the most part because there were pretty much no, no rules to what he could do. The nature of the series meant that he could pretty much just be completely experimental with it, just try out all kinds of different gags, jokes, techniques that you just wouldn't get away with in pretty much any other comic. So is this a good point to start reading She-Hulk though? I don't think I've really addressed that question and I would say yes it absolutely is because prior to this series um, she'd appeared in her original solo title which was quite short-lived. It lasted about 24 or 25 issues I think called The Savage She-Hulk and that was that ran from about 1980 to 82. Um, and then it was cancelled, and then she next appeared significantly during John Byrne's run on the She-Hawks, uh, not She-Hawks, sorry, on Fantastic Four. Um, she appeared in that, as I said to her earlier, to replace The Thing, and she was in that book for about, I don't know, I want to say about 30 to 40 issues, something like that, before The Thing came back. So this was really the first kind of relatively long-running solo book that she was in. Um, and I would say it's definitely a great point to start reading because you don't really need to be familiar with anything that happened to the character before this. Um, if you know that she's Bruce Banner's cousin, um, that she's just super strong, and she was previously in the Fantastic Four, that's basically all you need to know going into this. And another great thing is that even though the end of Burns run in here with issue 50, I think it is, uh, it's not the end of the series. It went for about another 10, 10 issues or so after that. Again, that doesn't matter because Byrne wrapped up his own run here with a pretty conclusive uh, ending. Um, meaning 
if you just read if you just read this book this, if you got this particular omnibus or you read this run digitally or in what other collections might be out there i'm not sure how else it is actually collected at the moment to be fair but um i can tell you right now that the content in here is definitely all you need to get one succinct complete story experience so don't be worrying about specific things you might need to read to follow on from it afterwards unless you particularly love the character of course and then you can explore other runs like for example uh, Dan Slott's run it's a more modern run and that got an omnibus uh, not too long ago last year as well I think I don't have that one myself but I know that it follows this kind of similar style to this with the whole tongue-in-cheek comedy element storytelling storytelling style So yeah, I mean, if you if you read through this, and you like the character, you think that that's been good, <laughs> you've had fun reading it, then yeah, there's there's options to go on and to read future stories definitely. But I would certainly say that this is a strong starting point to kind of dip your toe into the water a little bit and see if uh, see if you enjoy She-Hulk as a character. But if you aren't prepared for this to just be completely off the walls crazy at times, you know, wacky as hell, and playing nothing seriously, then it might not be for you. If you do want to read a more serious story, as you probably gathered by this point in my review, this isn't what you're going to get here. Um, a nice little story here at the end where uh, She-Hulk ends up changing body types with her, her friend. And then I think we're about to get to the final issue, which I just want to show off because it does something very cool where there's a whole host of guest artists in this issue um, that all illustrate the page. The purpose of this issue, okay, so spoilers again, um, is that the idea is that John Byrne has died in this story and therefore She-Hulk's having a conversation with the editor of the book to discuss who's going to replace him um, and how they're going to basically draw the title. She wants to make sure that the style fits for the comic. So from that point on, you get a whole host of different guest artists. Uh, Frank Miller here comes on and draws it and does uh, panel layouts exactly like you would have been doing Sin City at the time. You can see the, uh, the art basically just styles from uh, art style basically just changes from page to page. Walter Simonson um, parodying his own style of uh, the beginning of his Thor run. Uh, that is um, ah damn it I forgot the name again but it's one of those that'll come to me again in another minute. But the point is it's just yeah just a host of cool guest artists. Uh, parodying, I think, uh, the Rob Liefeld style. And there's a short story here by the actual creative team who did ultimately succeed Burn on the Run. Um, and then in the end, Burn kind of breaks out the closet, turns out he's not dead, he's just been tied up, but then uh, she just throws him out the window. So the run actually ends there with She-Hulk basically killing John Byrne off. So if that's not a conclusive ending to a story that completely fits the tone of some of the ridiculousness that we've seen up to this point, then I don't know what is. Uh, in the back you get some extras, as you, do, as you usually tend to do in these books. You know, interviews with John Byrne, you get cover, uh, cover art. Character designs. Yeah, so that's that. That's the sensational She-Hulk omnibus. Uh, hopefully that was useful. Hopefully enjoyable. If I manage to uh, convince you one way or another whether or not this book's going to be for you, it is still in print, as far as I'm aware. Last time I checked. You can still find copies of this online, so uh, 
yeah, well worth checking out. If you liked what you saw here, definitely I recommend it for what that's worth. And uh, yeah, so I think that about wraps that up. Anyway, but if you want to go ahead and subscribe, like the video, leave any comments for me. Uh, as I said before, I'm happy to hear from anybody. Your thoughts on the book, the review, etc., whatever it is. But otherwise, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll get back to you with another video soon.